Welcome everybody to this stream of Breaking Absolutes. Uh, today I have Nathan James with me. Uh, Nathan is known for many things, and we're gonna we're gonna talk to him about them all, um, but focus uh, mostly on Inglorious, the band that he founded and fronts. Um, and uh, to begin, let me just kind of let you know a little bit about uh, Nathan, if you've not sort of associated the name with some of the work. Um, he did get the nod to to tour with Trans Siberian Orchestra for a few years. That's actually the first time I saw Nathan sing. Uh, he, I, he came through our town and um, really just sort of stole the show. And we'll talk a little, at least for, from from my perspective, and we'll talk a little bit about his time there. Uh, he spent time um, playing with Uli John Roth uh, from Scorpions, and we'll get a little bit of flavor on what that uh, meant for him. But the Inglorious, which is his band that he sort of uh, spun up and has been driving for the last many years now, has released four studio albums. Um, they just announced a forthcoming cover album that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, um, but but let me just let me just sort of say this up front so I don't forget later. There there are many groups right now that are sort of um, writing material that harkens back to a lot of the, the great rock music that we all grew up loving. Uh, and I hear, I've heard them all and there's good stuff. I don't mean, I'm not throwing shade on anybody, but there's something unique about the sound that Inglorious, um, and in particular with the way that Nathan sings that I think holds it a cut above most of that stuff. And so I'll commend you all to go and as I did and go much deeper on so much music that I was unaware of, uh, after we go through our conversation with Nathan, because as you know, if I, if I, uh, put any of that in the stream, all of these new copyright uh, things, they'll they'll take down the video and we don't want that. So with that as, uh, as a setup, let us bring Nathan on and we will get rolling. Nathan, welcome. Hey buddy, how are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Yeah, I've actually just been on my tractor mowing the lawn. So um, I, I forgot I had this interview, which is why I look like this no effort so sorry about that <laughs> no i this is the this is the all natural baby this is good <laughs> good yeah. um so yeah let me let me just ask before we get into the music stuff um you know how's how's covid been treating you what how's this 18 months gone for you uh horrible i think is that yeah. it's been awful uh i miss singing i miss the guys in the band uh I missed, I miss playing for people. I miss seeing people at shows. I miss, I miss so much. Um, I've tried to adapt. I've got into teaching vocals, which is something I feel really passionate about. Uh, the voice is obviously the thing that earns me my money and it has done for coming up to 20 years now. So I've always, always wanted to share my, uh, the way that I sing with people. And I've been able to do that in the last couple of months and last year. So that's been interesting. Uh, but apart from that, spending time with family and writing and recording, we managed to record two albums during lockdown. So yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah, it seems to have been for, uh, you know, at least some musicians, an opportunity to woodshed and get some work done. Um, and, and because I've become such a fan of, of your music, that makes me particularly happy. Um, uh, and we're going to talk about a bunch of it. Um, before we do, um, let's just... Talk about young Nathan a little bit. I mean, what was there a, a, a sort of seminal moment for you where it was like music will be the thing that I try and make my life's work? I was in choir from when I was about 11 years old uh, and I loved it. That gave me my kind of basics, I suppose, of singing, uh, gave me technique and gave me stamina and understanding of harmony etc so that was from when i was 11 but the moment that i genuinely thought i'm gonna i don't want to sing anything but rock and roll was probably when i discovered queen and i was about 14 years old my uncle gave me a greatest hit cd and i was just blown away like i i remember thinking wow this dude sings as high as a woman and that's so that i'd never heard before until that point so when I discovered Freddie, yeah, I, that changed it all for me. And in that moment, I was like, I want to do that. I want to sing high and powerful. And I want to be on stage with the, with great musicians and 
dance around and have everyone look at me. I think that he was, he embodies that for me. Yeah. That's a good one. It, um, I know everybody has that sort of, or, or many that I talk to have that moment this where things just click for them. Um, and it sounds like in terms of training, it was principally, um, you know, your secondary school um, choir work. Did you do any other sort of formal training? And the reason I asked to be really frank with you is um, there's, there's a quality to your voice that I want to talk about. Uh, and this doesn't come from just pure fanishness. Uh, I studied voice for a long time. And so usually when I have these conversations and I get a singer of your caliber, I like to kind of dig in a little bit because we've got fans of the channel who are musicians as well. And so there's, there's a quality in your voice and things you do that um, I think are, are uh, pretty remarkable. And it makes me wonder if these things are, are natural or if there's a, some training that's helped you sort of pull them out. There's been a lot of training. So the choir was actually, um, it was a choir that you had to audition for outside of school. So it was, um, I don't know, in our state, I suppose you'd call it, it was the state choir. Um, that I was a part of and we had incredible instructors there and it wasn't until I was there that I thought okay I can sing in a group but I want to sing on my own you know I want to I want to be Freddie Mercury like I want to sing at the front and then I had got a singing teacher who is the same teacher I've had I have to this day uh, although I don't see her as often whenever I have problems or whenever I'm tired or if I'm in the area where she lives, I will go and see her. And I've seen her now coming up for like 18 years. Um, she guided my voice through the change of breaking in my teens. Uh, and she is, yeah, she's just filled me with technique. And tech, the good thing that I find about the voice is that the technique that I use is constantly evolving. So we're learning more and more about the voice with science every day. So there is different things you can do to manipulate it and to continue your stamina. Because I, the one thing that I hate about, I'm not going to say all bands, but a lot of younger bands is that there is no stamina. So I pride myself on being able to do six shows a week, uh, whether that be in trans Siberian Orchestra, two shows a day, whether it be in a theatre show, whether it be on tour, whether it be festivals. And I know exactly what I need to do to make my voice do that thing in that moment. Yeah. Every time, regardless of whether I'm sick or I'm tired, I have so much confidence in my technique that I know I can make it work. Um, and obviously, it's, it's, that's a scale, right? So it's not always perfect but I know how I can manipulate it to make it sound good enough. And uh, yeah, that all comes from, from technique, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, um, it's not that there aren't singers who do things naturally, but there's um, some of the things you do sound as though they come from somebody who really understands the voice. So that to me that those things, you know, sort of make sense. Um, so with that as a, Sort of a basis let's talk about some of the, the actual music in your career um let's start with tso um mostly just because it's the first time i heard you sing and i was unaware of you entirely until that the moment you came on stage um and you, you there was an i know that with tso you know there's a certain number of songs that are kind of yours as a solo for the night and then you do some backup stuff uh but you sang one of the times i saw you you sang uh their song someday uh, and Nathan, I've never heard that song sung by anybody anywhere better. Um, that includes the professional recording and it includes other live performances. It was so spot on, um, you know, which is, and that was in a live environment. So I, it made me wonder how, I wasn't able to find a lot on you prior to that. How did you come by this opportunity to sing on, on such a grand stage? TSO. Uh, actually have a talent scout who is constantly searching the internet for talent. Um, okay. And she discovered me on there and sent me a, a message on Facebook. And I'll be honest, at the time, I'd just come off a reality TV show in the UK. So I had kind of a profile in the United Kingdom. And 
she, she sent me a message and it kind of got lost along with other people being like, hey man, I've got this band. I'd love you to sing in it. And another dude was like, hey, I've got this band. And it was just so many offers coming in. Uh, and this one stood out because she said, hey, I'm a scout for this band in America. We want to fly you to Florida to audition for our band. So I was like, who the hell? Who is this? I was. It was crazy. Like, so I messaged back. I was like, okay, when? She was like, can you do two weeks time? Here's your ticket. Sent all the information through. It was happening. Uh, so I flew out to Florida, was picked up by Paul O'Neill, was picked up by a chauffeur originally. Uh, and then he took me to my hotel and then Paul O'Neill came and got me the next day uh, in his Hummer, in his blacked out Hummer. <laughs> and um, we drove around for three hours talking, him getting to know me. And then I think I went into the studio and sang with Al Petrelli for about two minutes. And then Paul went out back and he grabbed the TSO jacket and he came and put it on my shoulders and he said, you're in. And I was like, <laughs> it was like a, it was like a fairy tale, a rock fairy tale. Um, yeah. And yeah, weirdly, <laughs> they let me have like five days there just paid for like in the hotel went to the beach like had a great time they paid for everything and i thought this is unreal like what have i become a part of like what is this insane like group because paul was a legend you know the kindest man he actually gave i didn't drive uh i did drive like a few years ago when i started tso and <laughs> that first trip he said oh do you want a car while you're here and i was like oh no i can't drive and he's like that's fine you can use my tesla <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he he had his Tesla dropped off at the hotel for me to drive, and I tried to explain to him that I had no license and I could I physically couldn't drive, uh, but he left it there for me to to have if I wanted it. <laughs> it was just so it was so crazy. He was amazing. Wow, wow. I, you know, I have heard a few <laughs> stories about his magnanimity, um, but you know, gosh, uh, you, you know, you tell that story, it sounds like the rock star story. Um, from from nothing to like the, the big stage, and uh, you know, the, whoever their talent scout is, um, does a good job of it because um, you know you came in and you singing some tough songs uh, from their from their catalog to a crowd that like knows that music so intimately, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of scrutiny there. Love it's it's love scrutiny if that can be, if that's a thing. But they, you know, they want to hear it with all of its grandeur and power and all the things. Um, and just, you know, for my own edification, I went back and watched a bunch of your performances on YouTube uh, and uh, Dynamite stuff. Um, Thank you. But then you, so you did that for a little while, um, uh, which was amazing. Uh, by the way, the, the, the version that you did of The Three Kings and I that then has the cashmere thing, there isn't a voice better suited to do that than yours. Like it was, it was, uh, I didn't see that one live, but that was amazing. Thank you. No, I, lo I loved that TSO was such a challenge for me. And Paul really pushed me as a vocalist because up until that point, I'd spent my whole life trying to sing high, right? So I'd, like my only goal in life was to sing as high as Freddie Mercury and Glenn Hughes and these, these guys. And then I met Paul and Paul was like, I don't want you to sing high. And I was like, what do you mean? That's, that's what I, that's why I'm here. Surely that's why I'm here is because I sing high. And uh, he said, no, I want, we're going to bring the keys down. So he brought all the keys down and really made me kind of use this baritone voice, which um, was really uncomfortable for me at the time. Yeah. Uh, I'm thankful for it now, but at the time I remember pushing back and being like, I'd really, really like this to be just one tone up so that it can sit in my sweet spot. Uh, and he wouldn't have it. And I, I guess he was right, because everyone seems pretty happy with how how I performed the song. So there we go. Yeah. I guess you got to listen to the producer guy. Uh, I, exactly. I, they, you know, they, he, uh, by all accounts, he had a very strong vision for what he wanted to hear. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it probably just built new uh, complexity into what you can do. Uh, there's certainly some songs I want to talk about from Inglorious where I think that's true. Um, so let's let's move before and but before we get to Inglorious, let's talk just a little bit about um, this work you've done with um, John Roth. It, uh, is this was this a bona fide sort of band or was this just sort of a touring thing? 
that you did? It was, I did two albums with him and a live DVD in Tokyo, which was amazing. And I did tour with him as his singer for quite some time. Uh, I loved it. I really did love it. He's incredible, uh, incredible to work with. I learned so much. And the, the first time we recorded Scorpions Revisited, we recorded the album in the school hall where the Scorpions rehearsed as, as kids. Oh, wow. <laughs> which was like just unbelievable on the stage where him and Klaus would have been it's just insane like to think to think that um so that was pretty awesome went all over the world we opened for Deep Purple at um, a festival in Geneva and I got to jam with Steve Vai and Steve Morse and it was it was just a, a crazy time um but I knew ultimately that Inglorious was going to get busier and yeah. and it did do and I I I always wanted to be one of those singers that was known all of my heroes were front men of one band you know like they were known for like being the guy from that band and I had this kind of idea in my head that I wanted that you know I wanted the what Robert Plant's got or like what Freddie's got or like like those guys, Coverdale in, in White Snake, you know, he, he's got that, you know. Um, but I, yeah, so I didn't want loads of projects going on on the side, and that's kind of why it came to an end ultimately. But um, now I'm at a different place, you know, this is like coming up to oh god, 10 years since I joined TSO. So it's a lot of things have changed, and I'm now at a place where I'm willing to explore myself as an artist a bit more and also try making music with other people which i'm i'm really enjoying yeah well i you know i love the collaborative stuff you've done and i'm sure there's more of that in your future but the, a lot of the focus seems to have been over the last many years um inglorious and um i really do want to get dig into the music because i think that if we if people hear this music um they're going to this is a band that they're going to start to listen to um, for for lots of reasons. Um, so uh, let's kind of dig in a little bit um, on Inglorious. First of all, the sound itself. The uh, you, on your website, you talk about um, wanting to work with musicians that um, and take an honest approach. When you say honest approach, how do you mean that? I think when I started the band, everything I was hearing was overproduced and it just sounded fake in that people's voices were being manipulated to the extreme. Uh, guitarists couldn't play. Uh, drummers couldn't drum in time. Everything was pulled to the grid. Uh, <clears throat> it wasn't real. And having come from a place before this band where I've literally toured the world with the best musicians on the planet, um, I wasn't going to be a part of something that wasn't as good. Yeah. I wanted I wanted to be surrounded by great people as I have luck, been lucky enough to my whole kind of life in rock. So that was what I meant. I wanted people who, who weren't faking it and who could make it sound exactly the same live as we did on the album. Yeah. Well, um, you achieved that. It, um, at sort of the, you know, if there, there are layers to a sound, having a sort of honesty is is one thing. There's also, though, when you start to get into the definition of the sound, you guys do, there not all the time, but there are places that there's like this really great Southern um, feel to the music, whether, and, and there, are, there are telegraphs of that, whether it's a slide guitar or a, a lick that, that does that. But you, much of the music, you're like the spiritual inheritors of like a Leonard Skinner with all of that soul and, and power. Um, and that's to me. That's really exciting to find a band that that um, carries that torch. It was did you have in mind that this is the kind that, like this is how the this is the tradition you not specifically Skinnerd, but this this rock um, this older rock that had came from more of a soulful place was how you wanted to make music, or did that just come as an artifact of who you are as a musician? I think I was obsessed with the blues you know i was obsessed with the blues singers i was obsessed with soul singers and people who 
when they sang, it looked like they were doing nothing. You know, it just fell out of them. Yeah. I, I was obsessed with those people who it felt so na it felt more natural to sing than it did to talk. And all of my heroes have that. Paul Rogers, you know, like Coverdale, Hughes, all those guys emit soul more than anything else. If you've got any of those guys to sing some of the standard Motown songs or standard soul music from the 60s and 70s, it would be incredible. And that's kind of what I loved about it is that it was real. And it's also the one thing that you can't fake, I don't think. Right. You can't teach timing. You can't teach ry rhythm. You can't teach understanding of how things feel, you know, and emotion and that's what I kind of pride myself on as a singer the most is that whatever I've been able to do, I've always tried to bring some authenticity to it um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of faking out there, which I just am um, turned off by hugely. I find it to be and I come from a country that like considering we're full of like old white dudes, like there's a lot of soul in them, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> we've made a lot of soulful singers. Um, so I feel like it's a, I don't know, some weird British like heritage that I've, I've learned from and hopefully that I can take forward. I, uh, well, you know, I get to say it. I think you absolutely are taking it forward. Um, and it's, you know, it's the old adage of standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, you know, there's, they've kind of built this thing, but you've, you're adding something of your own to it. Um, and I've got some tracks that I want to highlight that I think hold that to be true um in fact let's just kind of cut to the one that that bowled me over and we'll, we'll work backwards um but i was i was kind of just tooling around um listening to a bunch of stuff and i happened upon um your your song glory days um there are those times I, you, you tell me if you're like this with music where you hear a song that um stuns you and you have when you're done listening it to it, you just think about it for a minute before you play it again. Um, doesn't happen all the time. And I listen to a lot of music and I love it all. But this song did that to me, man. I it was, uh, and I want to talk about it for fans who haven't seen it and ask you about it. So the way you shot this, uh, at least the video I saw, there may be other versions, but you you walk into this looks like a little diner or something. What's remarkable about the way they shot this and the way you performed it is it's a single shot. There's no cuts. There's no MTV bullshit. It is you walking in, you sit down. It almost has the attitude of prayer because you're sitting there. You first thing you do is you kind of fold your hands and you're kind of looking up and the camera never moves. And it just, and you, and you sing this song, the, the compliment, the first compliment I want to give you here and, and, and to frame this for fans, uh, and people who don't know you and why I think Nathan and, and then Glorious deserves, you know, you know, for you to give them a taste is a lot of your contemporaries that have great voices and can do that Coverdale thing and, you know, um, hit notes and all that stuff. Uh, one of my criticisms of them is that um, very often when they're singing, it's like, you know, they know they're singing. It's like the, it's, it, it, there's a certain sort of performance aspect to it that somehow is sort of um, too self-aware. You're not like that when you sing. And it's not only this song. It's just that this song, I think, is a really, really good example of it. But there's a, there's, it's to me, and this, I, I understand all music is biased, but uh, when I watched you do, perform this song, it, it typified what I'd seen in so much of the other stuff is that you give yourself to the song. So, you know, and whether it's coming from personal experience or whether you're just able to channel feelings that the song is representing, um, it's, it's a, I, I, and this is a weird, maybe on a rock metal podcast, but it's a beautiful experience to watch someone sing a song where they just are delivering the song for the song's sake. Um, and it was amazing, dude, that, that it really was, it, uh, it, I got chills and then I watched it again and I listened more intently to the lyrics and you got me weeping a little bit. <laughs> so i i don't know what that says about me uh it's firstly huge thanks for that because this is when 
you sing like I do, and when like this is something that I am, I'm aware of that I'm doing it because I feel it when I do it, right? I feel all of that in the video, actually, in that take that we used, I am crying in the middle I, section. Like, yeah, I'm I literally am crying. And when I recorded it in the studio, the actual audio, we had our A&R guy there from the record label that that one day and I did the take and they were like, OK, do one more take and we just go the whole way through. And I said, give me one minute. And I went outside and I had a talk to myself, went back in, did that take in its entirety. And my voice was so on edge in that middle section that you can hear it shaking on the track. I'm literally crying in the studio. And after I finished the take, I just sobbed and I had to take the rest of the day off because it has to be real. There's the lack of authenticity is what is ruining rock for me because this it's all about posing it's yeah. it's posing and it's hiding emotion and the reality of being able to play well i want things to be great i i i want everything to feel real and awesome and that song is an example of it and the reason i'll go a bit more into that for you the reason that song and that venue is so important and why I found it so easy to draw on that emotion is because in that exact booth is where the relationship with that person that the song is about ended. Oh, wow, dude. So it was quite deep of, and brave of me to say to our video guy, I was like, okay, I had a massive fight with an exit uh, and I want to do a video there. And they were like, okay. Uh, I was like, I want one camera uh, and I want no fuss. And that's why it came across so real is because it's totally raw. And I'm willing to put my heart on the line. You know, I believe in this thing. I believe in the band. I believe in the song. I believe in my talent. And I, I don't think enough people are showing that much now. Not, you're not getting enough heart from people. I, boy, I couldn't have said that better. Um, that's exactly it. You're not seeing enough heart in, you know, people wonder, I know rock's not dead and that, that whole silliness, but there's, um, I think what made rock uh, a music that people gravitated to and connected with was this honesty and um, uh, the emotion. A lot of the stuff, it, particularly now with groups that are trying to reach back and recapture some of the sound, um, the, the, the most critical component is, is what's missing. And that is precisely the thing that Inglorious does really, really well. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll put a link when we, when I finish this up to your website, but we'll also do a link to that song in particular, because it, um, I think it's the, it, I don't know, they, they use this term called a, a gateway drug. Uh, you know, marijuana is the gateway drug to everything else. It's maybe a bad analogy. This song, though, could be a gateway. I think if I think people seeing that it, it would do a good job of helping them understand what Inglorious is about, um, because it it does. Uh, I mean, e even to get into the technical bits just a little bit. Um, very very first phrase you sing. I guess you heard a whisper. You you use this. You start in a in a pretty high place pitch wise. And so you get into this, but it's always in this like nice rounded, smooth tone. And then you drop out of that compression into a, a very light thing. And so the technique that you're using in, as you tell this story, um, not, not that everybody has to have that, but it's, it just shows the, the, a level of musicianship that just awed me. Like this was on my third time. I had to get past the emotion of it to start to, to dissect what, what the hell you were actually doing with the vocal, you know, and then, and then there's some bold choices later you have a line where you sing um uh i'll never make the same mistake and you go into this beautiful falsetto like it's uh and not just not just hit the note you do this run up inside of it and it's just this pure tone um anyway like there's so the the, the point i'm making is that inside this song which you know at a blush is kind of a ballad um, there's there's so much going on in terms of technique and emotional sort of conveyance, um, and I, I 
I when I stopped, I kept waiting for uh, an edit. Like, oh, they're going to come in from the side now, or they're, you know, we're going to see the girlfriend back at home smoking a cigarette. None of the things. It was just the, the it was your soul laid bare. We don't see enough of that. Um, that was, I mean, I want to say bold, but on the other hand, because that's the kind of thing that Clint Eastwood does when he shoots his The Unforgiven. Like, they're known for these long shots just to mm-hmm. let you, as the viewer, see it and, and feel it. Um, and it, that's a, I had the same reaction, Nathan, as when I saw uh, Johnny Cash's version of Hurt. Uh, you, there's, I don't know if you've seen it, but he does a video. Have you seen that one? Yeah. Holy that, shit. I just, I can't believe you're saying these things. It's just so kind. Thank you. Well, I don't mean just to lavish you with <clears throat> praise. It, um, I do it deliberately because they're the, it's the, not, and I want to talk about some of the, of your music, but this particular song, I think is a, um, it's a cauldron of so much of what Inglorious does so well. And, um, and it'd be a good way for people to start. And it's not your, you know, yes, it's, it's ballad-esque, you know, uh, uh, in a way, but it's, um, you don't sing it predictably. And this is the other, this is one of the other things I found uh, as Nathan, as I was going through your music that I think sets it apart. There's a, um, it, let me give you some examples uh, as I was going through um, songs like, um, it's also ballad-esque, but the song Wake, from your first record. Um, I mean, there's tons of examples that, that, that have the sort of really great um, bluesy, gritty thing that you do so well. Um, the song, uh, She Won't Let You Go. You make these, um, and, and, and so I'm drafting off the point about um, um, Glory Days. You make these um, melodic choices that are unpredictable uh, and uh, places where I, the guys in sort of your your bench that are have the notes, have the range, and have the grit, and can do the things, um, uh, make choices that are f- sort of for self gratification versus for the good of the song. And I feel like I'm qualified to say that because I'm a songwriter. I've written records. I've you know I I've been I've toured as a musician. So I, I'm not saying this as a fan who doesn't know. From, from yeah no i understand um and so it's it's delightful to me to listen to uh you this music um because what and i i don't i want to ask you if this is instinctive or if you labor over it but when you'll all of a sudden do something with your voice whether it's hitting getting to a note or or doing a run or or turning around a note that um it, it can't be anticipated based upon predictable rock stylings and so to me, what it suggests is that like when you're writing to this, you're just looking for the melody that makes the song work. And if that's true, dude, that, that it's, it's another place that Inglorious is different than almost all the other bands that are trying to make this music. Is that, am I, am I off in left field or? No, you are entirely right. And I think <sighs> I've obviously written four albums now with the band and I think all melodies and lyrics, apart from on two songs, uh, are all me. So every one of those choices is is by me, and it's. I think I've got better each time, and hopefully I'll keep getting better as a writer. But ultimately, in the beginning, what I was about was showing off my voice. Right, I I was twenty. 24 25 i wanted to show everyone just how high i could sing and how long how long i could hold the note and just to because that's what initially grabs attention right sure. yeah if you're watching a youtube video and a guy's there and he's like yeah you're like okay cool like i'm gonna watch it you have to have something else in order to to have a career and i learned that quite quickly uh so yeah, I really did get into that, and I learned to take choices that weren't necessarily for my voice. They were they were for the song, and I think my understanding of melody and comes from my understanding of my voice. In that, I know whatever choice my brain hears, I can do it. I'm not I'm not I'm not limited to whatever this can do because I know it can do anything. Yeah, yeah. I have total confidence in that. I was going to say precisely that. I think um, what's 
the reason you're able to do that is that you um you have the the the, the range the, the technique you all of those things are kind of tools in your you know songwriter and vocalist toolkit so when you think a thing um it's available to you to perform it and not all vocalists can do that they have to uh, and that you know we all work with what we have and we can still make great music but it's a it's a blessing for you that um you know there were songs where um, and i think one of them was in she won't let you go there there are these bridges that you'll do in breakdown sections um where there's just kind of a predictable approach that a lot of rock bands will take and then all of a sudden you sing something i think it was that very song but there's a bridge in it where the uh, the bridge uh, could quite literally have also been the chorus. The, the hook is so strong. Uh, and you do, um, you know, you sing this melody that isn't obvious to the instrumentation, still works beautifully with it. Um, but then that's not the only song. But it just, as I continued to go through the catalog, I kept, uh, you kept surprising me with the choices you were making. And uh, some of them were really high. Um, some of them were, were soft. There's a lot of your songs where the verses are are more bare and there's more sort of space for the voice. And you, you know, you, you allow yourself to be lush and and do things in a lower register. Um, but you have this this tone. I call it my my vocal trainer called it a covered tone. But when you get up into the high stuff, it never gets shrill. Um uh, is that something that you worked at, or is that are you just is that a blessing of biology? <laughs> Well, the vo as you know, the voice, all voices are, are biology. So you can manipulate it to a degree, but whatever your mother and father had, you're going to probably get an amalgamation of the two, right? So I'm lucky. My dad has a huge larynx. Like his, his voice is loud, right? So I get the loud kind of big larynx from him. But my mother has quite a high voice, so I also managed to get that. So I've got a big, loud and high set larynx, which <laughs> makes it better for me to sing. If you've got a tiny larynx and <laughs> it's really low set, it's going to be harder for you to sing. Um, so biology has a lot to do with it. And I think just years of years of pushing it to the brink, you know, I really did yeah. like spent so long getting up there and i hated my tone as a as a like teenager i really did struggle with it because i thought it was shrill and i thought it was thin and i'm i'm not going to name any of the singers that i i don't care for because that's shady but singers to me that have those thin eh, voices i just don't feel anything from them yeah i don't feel anything and I need, I need there to be, I don't want to be distracted. I don't want people to be distracted when they hear me sing. I want them to hear it and enjoy every aspect of it. You know, the, the tone, the, the brightness, the whatever it is, because that's, that's the first thing that people hear. You don't really know what the lyrics to a song are until you sit down and read them. Like, honestly. Yeah. Uh, so you have to make sure that it's a nice sound. Otherwise you are, otherwise no one's going to listen to you. You know? Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. The focus uh, has always been first and primarily on the singer. You know, you that's just the way human nature is. Um, yeah. So how you deliver that is is paramount. Um, and then people, and, of course, go ahead. And interestingly, one thing that I find fascinating about the larynx and the voice itself is that you know how when you watch the video of me singing and I was crying, you cried and you felt something in emotion and you probably felt that lump in your throat and all that. That's just a trick, right? Because the biology is, is that the larynx is so intelligent that when I cry, my larynx is high set, it goes really high and I'm really upset. Yours hears that and mimics it. Mm. That's what's happening. It's literal biology. like. From back in, from the first people that ever walked the planet, cavemen, whatever. When a mother, when a mother's baby is crying, she would know that even if she couldn't hear it because she, her larynx would have picked up on that, and that is what I find mind blowing. So you, yeah. if you can get your larynx into a place that make 
imitates the cry and you're really up there and everything's really sad yours will do the exact same and then that will trigger you crying wow yeah that is fascinating and as you say it though makes all kinds of sense i'll even uh, in fact i've even noticed times when um I'll be, I'll be listening to a vocalist i can feel my own throat trying to emulate it even yeah. without you know what i mean it's like it's going through some of the musculature in order to try and, and pretend it can do that stuff too mm -hmm. um yeah, it, it, it makes tons of sense to me. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a couple of about a couple of very specific things you do, um, and these might just come naturally to you. Um, but you do you do more runs uh, than a lot of other vocalists, where you you know, uh, not the crazy, what I would call the crazy distracting ones that go on forever, but you'll do the you'll you'll do some really cool runs that'll move up and down and in and out of notes, even in your higher stuff. Um, that just give this th these embellishments to the to the music. Is that is that a, a stylistic thing that you've you've cultivated, or is it just the way you hear it when you start to do the songwriting? It's kind of the way I hear it, but also I'm hugely influenced, as well as by the the great male singers of all time, by a lot of female singers. So the the Whitney Houston's, the Celine Dion's, the the greatest singers to ever walk the planet probably you know i i love what their instruments can do and for me having spent my life growing up in the in the 90s uh there was a lot of that around you know a lot of incredible actual singing around which now so much is not in favor yeah. and um when i do that i kind of just feel it feels great to do because like probably because not everyone can do it i don't know there, there's something about it that i know it sounds interesting and it keeps it interesting instead of me hammering away on one note yeah and i don't do it all the time it's just it feels natural for me to do it again authenticity it feels if it feels right for me to do it and it feels natural i'm going to do it um i'm not going to be limited by what people say I, I should be doing as a rock vocalist, you know? Yeah. No, I love it. Um, I, and I don't think, I, I didn't mean to suggest it's overused. Uh, I think you use it um, to great effect inside the song. And in, in like in the song that we talk so much about Glory Days, when you do that really, really high thing, you do a little bit of that. There's some movement in that at the very, very top um, that, that just keeps it fresh. Uh, you know, it's um, like I, I said before, unpredictable. That, that matters a lot to me or and I think anybody who listens to a lot of music, because if you get to the point where you kind of know where the chord progression is going and where the, the vocalist is going to take the fifth or the third or whatever, it's like, OK, and it can still be cool. But, but Inglorious Music isn't like that. Um, and, and by the way, there's a whole part of a conversation with the music about the, what's, do, what's going on rhythmically um, that's really, really cool. Um, we're focusing more on you and your voice, but um, the, the the music itself does some really interesting things um, rhythmically, in addition to the sort of sound we've discussed with that has hallmarks of some of the really great um, bands of the 70s. Um, I wanted to ask a question ab um, about the lyrical content. Um, in the, the record We Will Ride in particular, and this might be, this, this might be someone with too much time on his hands trying to create something. So tell me, you know, hell no if, if I'm off here. But you do, got, there's a number of songs like um, He Will Provide, uh, We Will Meet Again, Messiah, God of War. Uh, are, is, there, is there some sort of overarching thematic line in this that's, that's speaking to feelings about spirituality or anything? Or is this all independent thoughts that just crop up as these songs are written? I never write uh, lyric first. So it's always about melody choice and music first. So the boys will come to me with a riff and that riff will then dictate what I feel the song needs to be written about because I don't like to try and shoehorn a lyric onto, a, onto music that doesn't match, you know? Right. Whereas, so I'll hear that riff for He Will Provide Da, 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 da. and i'll go okay this is menacing this is dark this is angry like 
where am I going to go with this? And then I'll go off on a tangent and write about that. I'll write the hook first, which is obviously mostly the chorus. And then I'll create a story around that hook. And that's how the, the song pads out. Um, so yeah, it kind of happens that way. And never really on purpose. This album in particular, there was like four songs that, like you, you said, that kind of had that. Um, I've never been one to shy away from the fact that I... I'm an atheist, so it doesn't, I'm not a, I don't like worship Satan or anything, but I just, <laughs> I don't, I don't believe. So I find, I find things that I like to write about are things that I, I struggle with the concepts of, do you know what sure. I mean? Cause it's easier for me to write about things that I'm angry about or I'm confused about than it is to me to write about something that I really know and I love. You know what I mean? Like that to me is, that sucks. Like I don't, I don't want to write all my things about things I love and things are great and everything's perfect. I want to write about things that keep me up at night and things that upset me and things that, uh, things that I wish I could change, you know? So that's kind of where yeah. on this album that stuff came from. Okay. That's good. That's really good. Well, um, I got to ask about this forthcoming uh, heroin album. Uh, I believe it's September 10th. It, it drops. Uh, we've got one track, which is a, the Miley Cyrus cover. Um, where did the idea for doing a, a covers album germinate? The label actually had it as part of our record deal. So we had okay. to do a covers album and I didn't want to do a run of the mill, deep purple, Dio, <laughs> rainbow, uh g and r whatever the hell they want to be through. i didn't want to do that um and i said look we've been doing this cover on tour of alanis morissette i love alanis morissette i think she's one of the greatest songwriters of our generation and um i thought okay how can i put that into an album how can that make sense and then it clicked i was like why don't i'm gonna do all all fem all female songs because it pushes me as a vocalist. It shows people a, a kind of another side of where I come from and why I sing the way I do. And we're also celebrating some of the best artists of all time that just so happen to be female. Um, yeah, and I don't think girls in rock get nearly enough credit. Uh, I think one of the greatest singers on the planet is Lizzie Hale. And I, I, she is, she's faultless to me as a vocalist um yeah. and yeah she should be as she should be as big as katie perry you know or like one of these pink or like she should be she should be there she should be earning millions and millions and millions of dollars like she's incredible um so yeah i'm, I'm all about celebrating the, the women on this album it pushed the band it gave us an opportunity to explore things that we wouldn't have done otherwise and yeah, we're using it as an opportunity to make some money for some uh, amazing charity here in the UK called Women's Aid as well, which is they help women who've been domestically abused. So I, for me, it was something I really wanted to do. And I, I'm i really proud of it. I'm proud of it because it's... There's this bizarre masculinity in the rock and metal community, which seem to forget that Freddie Mercury and, and Rob Halford exist, you know? Uh, <laughs> and I, I think everyone needs to just realize just how, how gay metal is. Like it's, it's so, it's so ridiculous. Like it's leather and it's like posing and pulling shapes and writing songs about ridiculous things. Like it's a very camp circus of, of music it's not all um that they'd like to think and i think no other band has ever done this i don't think i think we're the first band to do an all female covers album as an all male rock act which i I, I find that to be insane <laughs> that like how all the albums that have been made in all of the land and we're the, the first ones to do an all female covers album so whether it's their toxic masculinity that they have a problem with, I don't mind. I don't. I sing any song. Also, we haven't changed any of the lyrics to to keep it as true to those women as possible. You know, they wrote yeah. those songs. I'm gonna keep it 
as as they're written, we chose them for a reason. Nathan James is the queen of the night, you know, like it's it, I don't care. I don't care. Have you um have you released the track listing or is that yet to be disclosed? The track listing is out, yeah. So it's uh Queen of the Night by Whitney Houston. Um Oh, good God. There's so many. Just give uh, us a couple highlights. <laughs> Tina Turner. We're doing Nutbush City Limits. Uh, nice. We're doing Bring Me to Life by Evanescence. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which we're doing actually with my guest artist on that song doing the kind of like rap bits is Jeff Scott Soto. Oh, nice. You're a TSO brother. <laughs> yeah, TSO brother. So that's going to be, that sounds amazing. Um, the Alana Smore set cover we do, Uninvited. Also got Cindy Lauper, Time After Time. Um, it's like an acoustic ballad. I tried to keep things different. I'm also covering a Hailstorm song. So we did I Am The Fire by Hailstorm. Uh, Christina Aguilera, Fighter. I wanted to do multi-genre because I wanted to push myself as a singer and I know lots of people will be listening to it wanting to kind of like see how it measures up. And it's not about that. What it's about to me is is celebrating these amazing women and these talented human beings. Um, and yeah, just doing something a bit different, you know? Like, we can't... If we would have done a rock covers album, it just would have been so boring. Go and listen to the original, you know? Yeah, and it would... And there would have been this tacit expectation that you would do, you know, burn and you would do some white snake and you you know and by the way it, it always be great to hear you sing those songs but that is what people would have expected to hear you do uh so it's 100 percent. yeah you've taken a cool turn uh and i'm ex excited to hear your take on those songs i think it's um i think it's fun i remember a local band used to open their show they were and they were really heavy band but they opened their show with a heavy it up version of the friends theme <laughs> nice yeah and it, was, it just it, it broke everybody up and it ha had this great effect of setting people at ease it kind of disarms you yeah uh, so i think that this will be great i think people you know be able to you know because there is um there is some campiness there is some people who want to hold at arm's length other styles um and the but but i think that for the my experience is that most of the metal communities is pretty accepting um, I maybe live in a in a bubble there. I don't know, but the um, I, I actually had an anthropologist on my on my show, and she's done so, a ton of. She's from London, by the way. Uh, cool. Goes to London College, and she, um, she's done a bunch of research around um, the 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 culture of metal and uh, the degree to which it, it builds credibility by um, going to concerts and has a sort of um, inclusive nature. So. Um, what you're doing, I think, is pushing that boundary further, um, because as even if that what I said is true, it's also true that um, I can I can hear pe people in the world right now not quite sure they understand you singing, uh, you know, a, a, a Miley Cyrus song. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I don't know why people fight against it because. She she loves rock and metal, right? Same she does, as Lady, yeah. Lady Gaga, like Lady Gaga, whenever she's out and about and she's just being herself, she's got a Judas Priest t-shirt on, or she's got a a Journey t-shirt on, or Rihanna, like all these people are so inspired by this genre, and I don't know why we have to, why people have such a problem with them. You know, yeah. these are the big the biggest stars in the world. How amazing would it be if? one of these people shared also shared our music video like if, if Miley Cyrus ends up sharing our cover that could make my band's whole career which yeah. which doesn't happen within just the rock and metal community although saying that our next song our next single which is out in about a week and a half is Barracuda by Heart oh wow and, dude yeah and that's that's something that I'm really proud of and I can't wait for people to hear because Anne is just the queen of, vo of vocals for me um and huge pressure to be covering her but once you <laughs> i said this to the boys i was like we're never gonna make these songs any better so just forget that now like we can't improve yeah. these great songs so once you've resigned yourself to the fact that it's not going to be as good as you can just enjoy it and that's exactly what we did we enjoyed making this album yeah and 
and hopefully people will enjoy listening to it and maybe some new people will discover us. I think it's, uh, you know, I think your, your attitude on it is really healthy um, in not, not trying to outdo Anne or outdo Hart because uh, those, those, their fans are legion and, and you know, um, they like what they like. But, but you doing an homage to that because you love it um, and I think the spirit of that will come through. And I think you're right. I think the other cool potential level is a bunch of people learn who Inglorious is um, and come to it. So it's smart in a lot of ways. Uh, and I can't wait to, I studied with the same vocal trainer as Anne. So I can't wait to hear you sing that song, man. Uh, drops next week, you said? Yeah, the, there's a music video for it as well. Um, and I, I just love it. I love the song. We've played it obviously a bit heavier. So yeah. The intro, the intro, that gallop sounds like Maiden, you know, it's just like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> that'll be great. Yeah, it's oh, cool. Wow, yeah, I, uh, uh, Roger Fisher is a buddy of mine. <laughs> okay, so nice. I, I will, I will forward him the, you know, because he wrote it. I'll, I'll, I'll forward Amazing. him and say, hey, man, you got to listen to this. Get him to share. He has a thing called uh, Fisher Nation or something, Roger Nation. Uh, maybe I can get him to share it out to those guys, too. Amazing. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, that's, uh, we're, I don't want to, I've taken an hour of your time. Um, um, so I don't want to take more of your evening cause you're in, in the UK. So it must be getting late for you. Um, uh, I've got a singing student any second. So yeah, so it's uh, all good. Uh, yeah, I've been teaching vocals for the last year and I actually, I'm really enjoying it. I'm really enjoying sharing the experience with people. So if anyone is interested in a lesson, hit me up on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and we can talk about it. I'll put, um, I'll put your Facebook link in, in the show notes. Um, one last question, Nathan. Um, is there anything? Is there any sort of creative mountain you still want to climb? Uh, could be a different style of music, but it also could be, you know, I want to do some sculpting someday. Is there just a thing that you haven't had time for, but you know you want to try when you when the time permits? I want to do as many as many projects as possible. I want to become like the Mike Portnoy of vocals. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. I want to, I want to be in like a hundred bands now, like all at the same time, uh, because I think it keeps it fresh and, yeah. uh, and I'm trying, I'm doing an album actually with Joel Hoekstra from Whitesnake, Tommy Aldridge, Marco Mendoza and Michael Sweet, Michael Sweet, my dear friend, Michael Sweet. So that album I've just completed the vocals for. So hopefully that'll be, that'll be something to do, but to do a show and, I think to me, it's about making music with people that I love and respect. So if I can turn around on stage one day and Tommy Aldridge be sat behind me, I, I will have climbed the mountain. Like the, <laughs> I, the mountain is no more. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I was, I was going to bring that, that project up because I had a conversation with Joel the other day and um, we got talking about that. That's an exciting one. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, do you have any timing on it you can share or is that too far away? I have nothing. I just delivered my vocals and I had the email back from the producers today just saying how how much he loved what I did. So I'm super happy about that. So yeah, we will see. But it's so crazy, like tracking to Marco Mendoza and and Tommy. Like, to, like oh, it's just, oh, it's amazing. So yeah. thrilling. Well, we'll wish you all the success in finding those all those projects. Um, keeping Glorious going, man. It's gonna. It's, what's gonna happen with that is a domino is gonna fall, and then all the dominoes are gonna fall. I hope so, man. I because I, I'd, I'd love for it to be my one thing, um, but you know what the industry's like now. Like it's it's very it to make a living from this. And I'll be brutally honest, <laughs> I'm good at nothing else. Like literally, <laughs> I suck at everything apart from singing. So I kind of need to make this work. <laughs> Uh, because I would be useless at like carrying plates or like doing things to cart. Like, I just suck. So I, yeah, I have to keep working and keep doing different projects in order to make a living out of it. Like I have done. Yeah. Well, we'll, for, for this show's part, we'll do what we can to, uh, spread the news. Um, so grateful to you to, uh, have for you to have taken time with us today. Um, pre really, no problem. And um, so you go do your vocal students. And um, if you ever get into the States in Seattle, I'll be there. You came to Key Arena. I did. We met there. Yes. 
I love that venue. It's so yeah. cool. Yeah, you 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 sang there, I think twice. I think didn't you tour with them twice? I tour. I did three tours with them okay. in the U.S. and then I did the European tour and I did Varken as well. Yeah. Yeah, we met a couple of times backstage after the the Seattle show. I, you know, not that you meet so many people, but um, I remember when when you and we'll close the show with this. But I remember when you sang, and th there's a lot a lot of talent on the stage there. Um, but I, unbelievable. I remember, it, and I remember looking up because on in the female world, Chloe Lowry is like my favorite singer. Uh, she's she's the best. That's why. And then and then and then this other blonde comes out. This man <laughs> and he sings the absolute hell out of these songs. Um, uh, yeah, I just uh, I became an instant fan. Uh, I was training at the time, and I just saw this sort of north star of vocal ability. And I'm so happy that you've you've you know continued um, and keep doing all the other things. But I think I really do think Inglorious is unique. So you know we'll hope it falls. And I'm going to put a link to this Glory Days. I think it's a might be a good way. I know it's been out a while, but I don't think a lot of people still have seen it. And I think it's a good entryway. Beautiful song, dude. Like thank you, buddy. All right, man. You take care. I'll talk to you someday. Have a great day. Bye. Bye bye.